This is text called Interruption, as on a Riemann surface. And this is, uh, and yeah, Riemann, you must know about Riemann surfaces. I know, but I, I don't know much about the information uh, I mean, it's a Riemann surface. Uh, I don't know. It's yeah. a two-dimensional two surface with a complex structure, right? which means if you can measure angles somehow, it's an interesting way of measuring angles. Yes. Uh, so I'm curious, like, maybe certain functions, when you make a full circle come back to the same point, it gives you different value. So you measure the function here, it is 5, you make a turn, come here, this is 15. You make a turn, come here, which, which is a really curious thing, and we want that the idea of, like, making this two-dimensional surface kind of like a uh, split. So it becomes like a spiral from the surface. It's really hard to draw in my surfaces. Yes. To deal with them. And so there's a whole geometry there. Yes, yes. It's very complex stuff. Um, you know, it's not clear to what extent Lachaud is really engaging with the scientific thought. I, he doesn't do these things very lightly. They don't come up a lot in, in Lachaud. Certainly these references to, um, to mathematics. So I have a suspicion he must have read something. You know that was, the, the, you know, and read it carefully so that he wasn't scared to write such a sentence. But um, you know, he doesn't develop it in a way that it's very easy to, to work with, and I'm certainly not confident. But he is—he's um, trying to get at the notion of interruption. And earlier in the um, earlier in the, inter in the infinite conversation, he tried to evoke a relation between self and other that has a. A, a dissymmetrical character, so that the, the, um, the self's opening to the other would not be in the same spatio-temporal order as the other's opening to the fir that first self. Right? So my relation to you would not be the same as your relation to me. There would be a dissymmetrical interruption in that, in that relation. So there'd be a kind of distension in space and time, whereby they the might be considered to be from a, from a geometrical point of view, two points within a single space. Moshe says, this, this, in fact, this structure of speech, the structure of relation is such that um, the relation of this to this is not commensurate with the relation between this and this. So, and, and he, he, sort of, he sort of structures this as Dasein A and Dasein B, is there something like that, or self A and self B. So he, he gives a pseudo uh, mathematical or geometric account of that. And then he comes back here with this idea of a Riemannian surface. And I've, I've, a couple, I've discussed this with a couple of people who started talking about it, and I realized, whoa, this is way beyond, beyond me. In fact, one person told me that, in his view, there are very few people who understand Riemannian geometry, that it is extremely uh, obscure and complex. And, and that it's at the ground of a lot of other things, but you know, there are not many experts on Riemannian uh, space. Yeah, I mean, people about algebraic geometry use that, but they don't think of so his point in this essay is to try to um, think about an interruption at work in language. And as I was, uh, you remember from our discussion this morning, I, I thought we had a, a very productive reading of uh, literature on the right to death, but as, as I was suggesting, there, there is not really in that essay the presence of something like an interruption um, in language. That there would be this movement by which uh, literature moves toward an obscurity, there would be an interruption of meaning, but this, this figure of a, of a gapping or a breaking or a fragmentation is really not um, apparent in literature on the right to death. And I was trying to suggest, uh, just sort of thinking out loud, that um, I, I haven't changed that since this, since this afternoon. Um, that the, that the motif of interruption really does come in with the, with a meditation on the, pre, on the presence of the other, on, on the relation to autre, the relation to the other human being. Now, what really complicates this in terms of any kind of, you know, trying to account for some sort of development in Blanchard's thinking is that these complex relations among individuals are present in his, in his literature from the very beginning, from Thomas the Obscure in the first version through all the big texts and uh, the big literary texts, um, and of course we, we saw it in *Madness of the Day* that you know that discovery bit straight through my life, as he puts it. You know, there is a, a radical interruption um, 
which makes this question of the relation between the no and the yes um, especially uh, complex. Um, and the text is, is clearly fragmented. I mean, the, 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 you know, as he says, the, the, this doesn't this doesn't hold together a story. No, this is, this isn't you know, in part this itself, this text itself is not a story. It doesn't hold. And he says, I'd lost the capacity to tell to tell a story. So it is a it's very much a fragmentary narrative. And obviously, the, the question of the fragment is, is already there. Or the question of interruption is already there. But in terms of the theory, um, in terms of these reflections, uh, in in the literary space, and even to a certain extent, extent the space, to, this, the, the book to come. Blanchot is meditating on the literary experiences and experience of solitude as part of the one writing. Primarily, I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm emphasizing that a certain dimension of his theoretical thinking. And as he engages Levinas um, in particular, I guess he, he finds the capacity to uh, sort of introduce this philosophically, this question of the relation to the other. So I, I would want to say that a kind of ethical thinking, if we take that term in a Levinasian sense, was present um, already in his writing, but it doesn't really emerge until the 60s in, in the writing. And there we get um, this theme of interruption and increasingly the theme of fragmentation. So he's trying to get at the, um, the notion of, of interruption, and he says we, we have to distinguish the interruption he's trying to seek from anything that we would observe in convert, conversation or any rhetorical exchange um, that we might think of. And so, um, if we think of the, the relation that I was describing earlier today in, in, on the basis of his remarks on Bataille, um, the conversation that he has in mind cannot be thought from the basis of a, of a kind of give and take, where one person offers a, a statement, the next person responds to that statement, uh, carries it over, transforms it a bit, pause, another statement, and this, this sort of breathing of conversation, as he puts it at one point, would allow for something like a dialectical development, or a kind of, or even just a pause of respect between two parties who, who hold um, separate positions, but who are working in some sense toward a common, into a common space, or working within a common space. Here, he's trying to understand um, an interruption that is, is of more fundamental character. And again, this follows what we were reading in the statements on Bataille. But let me read to you from page 77. And he's summarizing, actually, I'm going to start at the bottom of 76 to, to take up this question of relationality. So within an the bottom of 76, within an interrational relational space, I can seek to communicate with someone in a number of ways. First, by considering him as an objective possibility in the world, according to the ways of objectivity. Um, I would be interacting with another, an objectified other as a, as a kind of pole of communication. Another time bear regarding him as another self, perhaps quite different, but whose difference passes by way of a primi, primary identity, that of two beings, each equally able to speak in the first person. So kind of a, a liberal respect for the other. Um, equitable exchange between selves. And then a third time, no longer by immediate relation of impersonal knowledge or of personal comprehension, but by attempting to achieve an immediate relation wherein the same and the other seek to lose themselves in one another or draw near to one another through the proximity of a familiar address that forgets or effaces distance. So what he is not seeking in this relationality, he's thinking some form of um, intimacy or um, some some proximity that would, as he says, efface difference. And certainly he's not thinking in terms of some sort of fusional relation, whereas the one and the other would discover their sameness in some immediate empathy. So whenever Blanchot is talking about um, community in, in a strong sense, whenever he's trying to talk about the social relation, he, he's trying to move past any, any of these three possibilities, treating the other as, um, in some respect, an object, as, as we would in a capitalistic relation, I suppose, in some forms of communication, treating the other um, on an equal basis, um, uh, as, as we would in, in a, most constructions of democracy, and um, in a in the third case, um, seeking with the other some form of fusion, or some form of um, imminence in a, in a community that, whereby these differences would dissolve. 
These relations, he continues, have in common the fact that all three tend toward unity. The I wants to annex the other, identify the other with itself, by making of it its own thing, or by studying it as a thing, or yet again, and wanting to find in it another myself, whether this be through free recognition or through the instantaneous union of two souls. So neither recognition, in terms of recognition of the other's thouness, for example, uh, nor uh, um, a, a, a kind of freedom. So the Buber's I-thou relation won't work either um, in relation to what he's saying. This time, it is no longer a question of seeking to unify. In the other I, in the other, I no longer want to recognize one. In the other I, in the other, I no longer want to recognize one who may still common measure the belonging to a common space holds in a relation of continuity or unity with it. What is in play now is, a, is the foreignness between us, and not only the obscure part that escapes our mutual knowledge and is nothing more than the obscurity of the self's position. So it isn't just a matter of the, the finite character or the finitude of a singularity, if we think finitude simply as that dimension of our being that escapes our grasp. Um, and if we fail to think the mid sign of that. Um, what is in play between us now is the foreignness between us, not the obscure part that escapes our mutual knowledge the singularity of the singular self, this foreignness is still very relative. A self is always close to a self, even in difference, competition, desire, and need. What is now in play and demands relation is everything that separates me from the other, that is to say, the other insofar as I am infinitely separated from him. A separation, fissure, or interval that leaves him infinitely outside me, but also requires that I found my relation with him upon this very interruption that is an interruption of being. So, I, I can't remember who asked me the question. Uh, but clearly, this is, he understands this to be an ontological break. And, he's going to, he's, and that's partly why he emphasizes the reference to mathematics, I believe. As he proceeds in this essay, he wants to make it very clear, this is not just in the social relation. This, what we see in the social relation of, of a difference between us, should prop, I think in more way he would say it, should be understood from the ground of being itself. And, and so he, he's trying to suggest that this is not simply um, not simply in language, so to speak, or that language reflects something that is of an ontological character. This alterity, it must be repeated, makes him another self for me, it makes him neither another self for me, nor another existence, neither a modality or a moment of universal existence, nor a super-existence, a god or a non-god, but rather the unknown in its infinite distance. An alterity that holds in the name of the neutral. So here's one of the places where he starts to bring the concept of the neutral into um, into this relation. I won't go into the, uh, you know, the, the mathematics again, but let me read just a little bit more here and then pick up again on the next page. To simplify, let us say that through the presence of the other, understood in the neutral. So here he's, he's, re he's really brought the language with which he describes autrui, the relation that Levinas describes. He's brought that into this context of thinking about the neutral and a, a disruption in the space between us. To simplify, let us say that through the presence of the other, understood in the neutral, there is in the field of relations a distortion preventing any direct communication and any relation of unity. Or again, there is a fundamental anomaly that it falls to speech, not to reduce, but to convey, even if it does so without saying it or signifying it. So, language would be conveying this alterity that is the presence of the other, a presence in, in the neutral. He continues, now it is to this hiatus to the strangeness, to the infinity between us, that the interruption in language itself responds. The interruption that introduces waiting. We were, we were looking at waiting in the passage uh, regarding Bataille this morning, and this is the, uh, this is the opening of that waiting in, the, in that emergence of the strangeness. It is to this hiatus, to the strangeness, to the infinity between us, that the interruption in language itself responds. And here, responding, you're already in conversation. The interruption that introduces waiting. But let us understand that the arrest here is not necessarily or simply marked by silence, by a blank or a gap. This would be too crude, he says. But by a change in the form or the structure of language, when speaking is first of all writing. A change metaphorically comparable to that which made Euclid's geometry into the I'll skip the parentheses. A change that the, such that to speak or to write is to cease thinking solely with a view to unity and to make the relations of words an essentially dissymmetrical field governed by discontinuity, as though having renounced the uninterrupted force of a coherent discourse, it were a matter of drawing out a level of language 
where one might gain the power not only to express oneself in an intermittent manner, but also to allow intermittence itself to speak. A speech that non-unifying is no longer content with being a passage or a bridge. A non-pontificating, that's it, the pun is talking about not creating a bridge, um, but also not in a mode of statement or declaration. A non-pontificating speech capable of clearing the two shores separated by the abyss, but without filling in the abyss or reuniting its shores. A speech without reference to unity. It's, there's a quite a, it's quite an astounding statement being made there. Um, now, first of all, it's, he makes it, uh, he lays things out in a rather straightforward manner. Um, the what he's seeking in language, this 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 becoming other of language, which we followed in literature and the right to death, but we're following now in, in this movement, uh, as it appears in the relation with the other human being, um, as, as in, in, insofar as it's a neutral relation. Um, He's, he's suggesting that this, this current in language, or this, this, this interrupted character of language itself, when it, in some respect, holds this relation between the two, or when it, in some sense, um, measures this relation, or occurs between the two, and, and, and it's trying to evoke an, an event, um, it is thereby, it, it's, how can I say, it is, it is, he says, it, it is not reducing, but it's conveying an interruption that is, that exceeds language. Conveys a language, conveys an interruption. Communicating in that sense, you know, but, but almost as though you would communicate a, well, it's not communication in the sense of communication that was signified, but a relay more. I, I think relaying is the, 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 the best term. Conveying an interruption. And again, this is an interruption which is um, thought initially from the relation between self and other, but I think he also he wants to suggest that that relation between self and other is reflecting an interruption of being that is of an ontological character. So, it is conveying a, a, an interruption, and it's conveying it within the... Um, with an estrangeness that marks its, its structure. The arrest here is not necessarily or simply marked by silence, by a blank or a gap, but by a change in the form or the structure of language. Now, if we look, of course, at the book, he's, he's trying to practice this interaction in, in various ways. And if we look at the dialogue we're considering, obviously this is a very pronounced form of fragmenting language, of trying to, um, trying to draw out this... Uh, this change in the form or the structure of language. But I think that, um, in some sense, he's, uh, he, he was marking it for us um, in the text we were reading this morning, in, in Literature and the Right to Death, when, when he comments on that passage from Kafka. That sentence is already, in its literary quality, um, already marked by a change, or marked by a suffering, this, this, this change that, that he's referring to. And so literary language is, Everything that describes the literariness of language in the various texts that he, uh, by which he introduces this would be, um, would be in some sense signaling this, this alteration that, that, has, that has overcome it, or conveying it in some way. But as Blanchot continues in his writing, you know, he, he, um, he works this more and more incessantly, more and more he tries to draw out this, this strangeness, strangeness that would attend language once it begins to uh, convey interruption. And so we have this becoming fragmentary. And this invitation to think, to cease thinking solely with a view to unity, to give up the reference to unity or identity. But that said, I, I, I want to underscore what I tried to accent as I was reading this. In the very last phrase of the, this page 77, as though having renounced the uninterrupted force of a coherent discourse. It were a matter of drawing out a little of language where one might gain the power not only to express oneself in an intermittent manner, but also to allow intermittence itself to speak. And there is this, what does it mean? What would it mean to, to gain the capacity to let um, interruption or effacement come to language? In the, in the passage that I read from 
uh, the writing of the disaster yesterday, I was citing the, when he talks about the, that interruption that is the, that is this, this passing of the infants, he, he describes it as, it, the, the terms are, are um, you know, are almost exchangeable, effacement or interruption or gift. And so he's suddenly suggesting that there, it is possible in practicing this, this interruption to, um, to gain the power of letting it speak. Okay, so there's that enigmatic power. And if we, as we get into the, um, the dialogue that we're reading, we'll see precisely these words taken up um, to describe what happens to the narrator of that text. Um, he gains the power this is a most, almost direct, direct citation, not only to express himself in an intermittent manner, but to allow intermittence itself to speak. So the narrator of this, of this dialogue that we're going to read experiences this turn that I've been trying to um, point to, this possibility of, a, of some sort of relation to the neutral, which, is, um, well, which will become affirmative or will entail this, this capacity to affirm. And there is a, uh, what is very um, striking in this passage, I, again I accented this, a non-pontificating speech capable of clearing the two shores separated by the abyss. This is, you know, the abyss, what are the two shores? These are the shores of death, you know, on each side, each, each dying, right? These are, these, are, this is, this, these are the shores of Styx, the river running between two. Um, if we understand this relation as a dying with the other, the river in question is Styx. And, uh, we take an ancient figure for it. And the word that he is describing here is capable of passing this distance between us, in the same sense, without reducing it. But nevertheless, there is a kind of communication of dying with, or communication in dying with. And that's what he calls, at one very brief moment in uh, the unavailable community, the language of community. But that's what community speaks. There is a, just a last, um, one more kind of preparatory um, citation. Again, I'm citing at long length today because I can't trust you to have been able to read this. Not trust you, I can't, I can't presume that you would have had bad time to look at this. So let me, let me cite a little bit more. In the middle of the pa uh, page on 78, He's asking again about the silence or this alternation that goes on between two people speaking. And he says, after the footnote number two, yet there is something more grave. When the power of speech is interrupted, one does not know. One can never know with certainty. This is partly an answer to you, Marcus, about the uh, question of evidence or uh, knowledge. One can never know with certainty. What does it work? The interruption that permits exchange, the interruption that suspends speech in order to reestablish it at another level, or the negating interruption that, far from still being a speech that recovers its winds and breeds, undertakes, if this is possible, to asphyxiate speech and to destroy it as though forever. When, for example, interruption arises out of fatigue, there we are, we're dead in the, in the, in the dialogue we're going to read. When, for example, interruption arises out of fatigue, out of pain or affliction, all forms of the neutral, and that's what I was alluding to two nights ago when I said all these different affects that in some way communicate uh, with the neutral. Do we know to which experience it belongs? Can we be sure, even though it may be sterilizing, that it is simply barren? No, we are not sure, and this moreover adds to the fatigue and the affliction. We sense as well that if pain, fatigue, or affliction hollows out an infinite gap between beings, this gap is perhaps what would be most important to bring to expression, all the while leaving it empty. So that to speak out of fatigue, out of pain, or affliction, malheur, could be to speak according to the infinite dimension of language. And can we not go still further? So, again, this is a part of what we will see. A, an attempt to speak out of fatigue, or out of affliction, in the, in the dialogue we're reading. Um, and thereby to, to speak, as he says, according to the infinite dimension of language. And can we not go still further? Let us suppose an interruption that would be, in some sense, absolute, and absolutely neutral. Let us conceive of it as being no longer within the sphere of language, but exterior and anterior to all speech and to all silence. Let us call it the ultimate, the hyperbolical. Would we not have attained with it the rupture that would deliver us, deliver us, even if hyperbolically, not only from all reasons, would be little, but from all unreason, that is, from the reason that madness remains? Or would we not be obliged to ask ourselves whether from out of such an interruption, barbarity itself, 
there would not come an exigency to which it would still be necessary to, to respond by speaking. And I'll just finish this. And would we not, not even have to ask whether speech, writing, does not always mean attempting to involve the outside of any language in language itself. That is to say, speaking within this outside, speaking according to the measure of this outside, which being in all speech, may very well also risk turning speech back into what is excluded from all speaking. To write, to trace a circle in the interior of which would come to be inscribed the outside of every circle. Again, I've been able to look through the dialogue, you realize this is, this is actually a commentary on the dialogue that we are reading, and this is precisely what the dialogue is engaging. And I, if we just if we go immediately to the last lines of the dialogue, we'll see um, what has what is being evoked. Again, this is one of those passages which is absolutely um, uh, guiding for me, you know, a, a, a guiding question for me. Just before the last, the very last paragraph, the last fragment, he alludes to a pure arrest, and then he continues. He, who's he? This will become other questions. Who's writing this? Um, he was listening to the speech of the everyday, grave, idle, saying everything, holding up to each one what he would have liked to say, a speech unique, distant, and always close, everyone's speech, always already expressed and yet infinitely sweet to say, infinitely precious to hear. And we're on page 23, sorry. What page? Page 23 of the, of the dialogue in the infinite conversation. Always already expressed and yet infinitely sweet to say, infinitely precious to hear, the speech of temporal eternity saying now, now, now. How had he come to will the interruption of the discourse? And that's the, that's the sentence that I was asking. How is that possible? How do you come to will the interruption of the discourse? And not the legitimate pause, the one permitting the give and take of conversation, the benevolent, intelligent pause, nor that beautifully poised waiting with, it, with two interlocutors from one shore to another measure their right to communicate. No, not that, and no more so the austere silence, the tacit speech of visible things, the reserve of those invisible. What he had wanted was entirely different, a cold interruption, the rupture of the circle. And at once this had happened, the heart ceasing to beat, the eternal speaking drive stopping. So, he wills a kind of, a kind of death, a kind of uh, an interruption. But this interruption, well, what is it? And how could you will such a thing, is, is, the, is the, uh, the question. I read this, and I, you know, I want to, uh, go, as we go into this text, to, to follow it. I read this as the, as that, um, as that, that as, a, as a step <laughs> into this other relation that we're talking about. And this is, in a, in a certain sense, this is the last step you know, that I try to think about in my, my writing. This is the last step, but it's not, uh, it's not a dying in the, in the crude sense, it's more the effacement that we read in the Madness of the Day. This is the step of effacement. Um, how had he come to will the interruption of the discourse? And at once this had happened. So there is, a, there is, a, there is the hyperbolic interruption that he um, points to in the, in the text on interruption that we have just read. The hyperbolic interruption, the rupture of the circle, of all circles. And at once a dying, the heart ceasing to beat, the eternal speaking, drive, stopping. But, but what is that? I mean, in some sense, it looks pretty definitive. Um, the eternal speaking, drive, stopping. But I think he's talking about um, something that a, a, a an arrest, well, an arrest of life that allows them this step, which is a kind of survival after this, um, after this effacement, after this, after this dying. Two men who have committed themselves to evoking an event, but are so weary that they probably have to reschedule, even though this is the last conversation. So he continues. They take seats separated by a table, turned not toward one another, but 
opening around the table that separates them, an interval large enough that another person might consider himself their true interlocutor, one for whom they would speak if they addressed themselves to him. And then the exchange starts. Forgive me for having asked you to come to see me. And the exchange is directed directly, to, I mean these words are, ex are directed to the, to, the, to the guest. I'll call these two the host and the guest. Okay? And then the first is the one who receives the, the, the one at the door. They're both equally weary. Um, but, but one has, and, and this, this beginning of this dialogue is all about, is a question about how this coming of the guest was possible. What happened that the guest came to see the other? But immediately, and this, it, it, you know, there's, there's the allusion to um, the possible presence of a third. They sit in such a way as another could be there. And of course they have promised to evoke an event. So evocations, if we are a little bit um, playful, but I don't think it's entirely inappropriate. It's almost as though we're, we're, we are sitting down to a seance now. Um, because there is, a, there is a third that is, that is haunting or may, 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 may become present. And, you know, I, 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 don't think it's, I don't think I should try to read everything with you here, but the, the beginning of this text is, is precisely about the weariness of the host. He has invited the other um, and saying, saying that, in fact, he has invited him because, because, precisely because he was so weary, and in his weariness he thought he would be able to speak in a way that he might not otherwise be able to speak. So, we, we, we initially understand this as a kind of a weakness, and um, I don't know if um, maybe others of you have had this experience, but um, I, with a previous partner in a previous life, uh, she used to say to me, you know, I think I really only love you when you're tired. <laughs> well, she was already translating Blanchot at the time, and you'll know who it is. Um, she was already translating Blanchot, but I think that she was talking about the fact that in fatigue, you know, that some barriers fall. That, you know, one, one, lets, one lets go to a certain extent. One doesn't, something passes under the radar, or something passes under the, the, you know, the control, or, or passes under a willful um, mastery of the situation. You know. So he thinks that perhaps, you know, he, the, the suggestion is uh, um, if I took the liberty of calling you, it was because of this weariness, because it seemed to me that it would facilitate, facilitate the conversation. So the suggestion is that weariness might be precisely a good thing to, to communicate what has to be communicated, though what has to be communicated, in fact, is weariness itself, or what weariness gives of a relation. Um, but then as it turns out, he says, well, what I didn't realize is that what weariness makes possible, weariness makes difficult. So he's too weary, in fact, to carry out this, uh, this hoped for communication. Now all of this is, of course, you know, as we read this, through these opening pages, there is no reason not to take weariness simply as, as, as a state of physical um, debility, right? A, a, a debility of some sort. Um, but as we proceed, the weariness will, will emerge as something else. It's, and and in the, the, um, elsewhere in the Power of Allah, he puts it very precisely. He says, this kind of, let's say, this kind of affliction, if weariness becomes an affliction, and the way we were just reading about it in the text on interruption, pain, pain fatigue, affliction, um, so forth. If weariness becomes an affliction, then uh, what one is experiencing is not a weariness in relation to one's ability to carry out one's activities in life. Uh, it's, not, it's not a weakness with regard to one's strengths within the world of everyday relations. Rather, this weariness reflects something or is, a, is, is an experience of something outside our life. If we describe our life as a, you know, as a set of concerns, as a set of interests as a set of activities. Right? So it's not that weariness is a, is a decline of strength in relation to some, um, some activity. Rather, weariness is something like a powerlessness vis-a-vis -vis something that has nothing to do with life. So it is, it is something more like a relation to death. Weir fatigue is a relation to dying, not to living. Okay? So they, they speak in terms that you know, immediately evoke a kind of um, 
you know, a decline in the forces of life. But this is not immediately related to life, at least if we think about it in terms of, I said, living interests. This is related <coughs> to death and dying. That will come out more as we come forward. But it, at the same time, you remember the, the, the text by interruption. He says, we can't ever be sure. I mean, you can't really tell the difference. Um, you know, that there's a point at which uh, um, affliction is unhappiness. <laughs> Malheur is, is unhappiness. A point at which fatigue is, is physical exhaustion. And, um, and this is something I think is, is really quite, um, quite beautiful in Blanchot. Uh, he will be very insistent in trying to say that in our relation to the neutral, we are not dealing with anything in life. If, again, if we construct this in terms of our living interests, the, the world of, of our activities and concerns, um, the world of uh, mid-dasein, as, as Heidegger would say, the world of, of pragmatic interests. Um, and in a certain sense, then, fatigue is what, um, weariness is what Heidegger calls, tried to call an Erfahrung, as opposed to an Erlebnis. Erfahrung and experience. And I was bringing out the etymology of that to say it's the traversal or passage by a danger. Far, gefar. And um, it's the same thing in, in the English experience. Experire, the pair in there points to a, a danger. Um, so the experience is a, an, an experience of, of, of going through, of suffering something that's coming from outside, menacing. It is uh, as opposed to an erlebnis which is um, a, a lived experience, as it's translated. Elevenness is more our, our feeling, our, um, uh, our feelings uh, in relation to some event. In Erfahrung, the self is overcome or goes through something, and, and that, that suggests a, a passage to, um, in relation to some alterity, whereas Elevenness is a feeling, and we could say, well, this, I feel this way today, or I feel that way today. It's not um, this kind of exposure to an outside. So Heidegger makes it, you know, and, and last week in lecturing on the art, art and the work of art, and for those of you who are not here, I was trying to suggest that Heidegger is trying to recover a kind of experience in thinking art, and that he's trying to get away from the way in which Erlebnis defines our understanding of aesthetic, of the aesthetic relation. It's not about how we feel in relation to art, or what we feel in which we express in art, um, but rather it is about going through uh, exposure to our uh, alterity, which Heidegger thinks is true. So we have this. Dis I'll, I mean, Marcus, let me just finish this point. Yes, I'll come to you. We have this distinction between Erfahrung and Erlebnis, which is a, a fairly common in, in, uh, in the sort of phenomenological context. And Blanchot takes this over in a way to say that these forms of affliction that he's interested in, he's talking about the way in which Erlebnis becomes Erfahrung when we when we really enter into that that form of affect. And, and think it in its, um, well, in its non-truth, or you might say it's truth, but what becomes something that can't be recovered by truth. But he also says, and this is, in the, I, I'm coming back again to the um, step not beyond, he says, we must learn to live this, or these experiences, he, he's talking about a specific experience in this case, we must learn to live it in both registers, because we'll never be without elevenness. You know, there'll always be um, uh, in this experience of dying, a, a, a pathos, and, and that may be very, the very moroseness that so many readers attribute to, to Blanchot. You know, he's, he, he seems to be a depressive, <laughs> morose type, and always talking about dying and the other night, and so on and so forth. Um, I, I don't read him that way at all, ultimately. It seems to me that, that something quite different is going on. But he was, a, you know, he was a very sick man uh, much of the time in he had some sort of bronchial condition when he was 17 years old. He was poorly treated, and he was sick for the rest of his life. Um, in the in the 50s, he was he was quite ill. Um, he was going to the south of France um, in part to deal with you know <coughs> psychic difficulties, but he was also he was physically suffering all the time. And um, you know he that suffering you know, comes through in the language. And but he he says uh, you know as I say he says very. Very explicitly, yes, we, we can't avoid uh, uh, um, uh, experiencing what, what he's trying to think in terms of a pathos, but we have to be able to read in that pathos something beyond that pathos. So, yes, he can be more of us. Yes, he can be, you know, uh, the, 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 all the tonality that accompanies his, his meditations on passivity, on patience, on 
passion in right, the sense of suffering, some alternative. All of that can be heavy, right? And it can be, you know, it can be. Uh, I say, I don't, I don't like, you know, being in this space. But he's not. Ultimately, he's not talking about elevness. He's talking about F. Yeah. Um, just the, the what we were talking about Heidegger. Um, I was wondering. I always read. I don't know if this is legitimate or not, but I've always read these opening paragraphs. The weary tone as a as a sort of reading on or a commentary on Heidegger, and like I think that the weary tone signa- indicates like it it's a reflection of, of the exhaustion of metaphysics. Like metaphysics has exhausted itself. And we live in a, a life world that's been constructed and dependent on like the metaphysical system, and this has exhausted its possibilities, and we're all extraordinarily fatigued being thrown into the situation. Well, I think that's not wrong. Um, I mean, I could see taking it in that direction. That you might say that, or at least that would be. It is, and that that construction is very Heideggerian in a certain sense. The West is, is exhausted. Mm. The West has, has exhausted its possibilities. Um, and sometimes, you know, as we look at at any given moment or at any given period, when we're looking at art productions or the productions of thought, we say, "Well, here it is." You know, it looks like the West is it can't go any farther. It's it's reached a kind of exhaustion or a kind of, of fatigue, and then suddenly something happens, and you know, we, we, we seem to be back in the game. But, um, you know, in a sense, I, I think, well, even in Heidegger, we wouldn't find that. Um, what, we would, what we find in, he, he would read in, through Herlinen's description of the morning of the passing of the gods, you might get a kind of stimulant that's close to depression. I can see that. Um, so he would say, he would speak of a shtimum of, of mourning and the experience of loss. And this is, again, if we're talking about tonalities or, or affects, he would say Blanchot is very melancholic in, in a certain way. If we think about this in the Freudian sense, that, that melancholy means the self cannot recuperate a loss. Right? So this is kind of an open-ended loss. And, um, and there's a certain melancholic tone here. But if we go back, if we just go back to Heidegger, the exhaustion of the possibilities of metaphysics happens in technique, and technique produces a kind of false frenzy, or a, a, a false, uh, not false, but you know, a, a kind of activity which is ever increasing in speed and um, uh, uh, intensity, I suppose. So um, the the end of metaphysics, you know, the, the, the closing of the epoch of metaphysics, is not. Um, you know, the, is not the Spenglerian decline or the you know the darkening. Um, the, the, we enter in, then into the phase of technique. This is very much like Heidegger in the sense that it, there is a. I think I think it's not inappropriate to bring in the word stimulant, in different uh, affects or different uh, tonalities or, or different um, uh, states of attunement um, to talk about. You know, fatigue, for example, or affliction, or or others. These are these are. These are passions or affects, and, he, and that's the, those are the terms that he um, uses when he talks about them in his book, The Unavowable Community, when he, when he points to what we might call the passions of community. And, and that's leading us back to uh, the power of the law, the step not beyond, where he goes to long passages talking about fear and anxiety, and I think I mentioned this yesterday, but long, long, long discussions of the affect, which, in, in which he tries to bring out the way in which these forms of affect are uh, uh, represent kind of opening to by which the self loses itself. So in fear, fear is um, Blanchot's fear is closer to Heidegger's angst than, than Heidegger's fear because fear is not about an object. It's the, you know, there is a, a fear of dying, but the dying is itself an open-ended um, process in, in this text. So. He's touching upon each of these affects, and he, and he says that um, if, if we if we if we consider them in, if we if we how can I say I almost want to say if we consider them in their truth, but here truth means uh, an undoing of truth. If we consider them in their truth, um, we'll see that this infinite always afflicts or always attends any of these affects. So in every of the every one of the affects by which there are social relations or by which we, we relate to others in empathy. Um, in every one of those affects, there is, he would say, the presence of a neutral or a, a, the opening of a relationality that can become a neutral relation. 
And so even if, if fatigue, is, he says in um, the essay that I was reading, Reflections on Hell, he says, in our societies where um, productivity is pushed to, to a maximum, there is a kind of fatigue on the part of those laboring, which they may not be aware of at all, uh, but in, in fact is already um, the presence of an intimate relation, a, a neutral relation in which they are losing themselves as selves. So, uh, I, I find that very, that's what I was trying to, to allude to in my, my paper, I find that very very intriguing. I, I, I haven't seen critics pick this up in Blochow, but he, he really is saying in every, every affect, which we might link to social relation, there is this infinite attending. And so fatigue here is, is, um, uh, is, is an instance. It is, it's something that a phenomenology cannot quite capture. Um, the phenomenology will always give us these different affects of the self. This is not the affect of the self. This is the self afflicted by something else, something outside. And so it is a, yes, it is the fatigue of a powerlessness, but it's a powerless, not powerless, not in relation to something that requires strength, but the, something that is impossible to relate to. And it's the fatigue is precisely from that impossibility. You have no capacity in relation to it. Um, it's not about a power or a, um, an ability, because there is no ability in relation to the neutral one, at least um, in this initial stage that we're talking about, until this other power that I'm referring to appear, which is why that reference to power is so striking. Yeah? And maybe it's not an ability, but there is the, the sort of welcoming or the opening to that, right? To that, to one's own, I mean, not just one's own, but to the, to the powerless, to the, to the gap. Or to the yes, although, you know, I sort of want to be faithful to this text and, and even a little bit to the madness of the day. That, that, that passivity, you know, that, that welcoming of um, alterity, it's, it's not a pleasant experience as yeah. it's described here. Um, and one of the, I think the really intriguing things I, I sort of want to dwell on this beginning with you, the reason I want to dwell on it with you is that um, there is, as I, there are two here, one is in advance of the other, apparently, in this, in this dying or this fatigue. So the other comes to aid them, um, and, and there is a very human kind of gesture on that part, an effort to help the other through this, um, through this moment. And the, the host, then, the one who is in advance, the host needs the other, in some sense, um, both because they need support, but also because they cannot effect this passage without the other. Right? So, um, th th and there's always this doubleness, and again, this uh, probably links to what I was saying about Alevness and Arfahom as well, but I, I'm not quite sure because I think that this engages um, the human of a relation that's becoming inhuman. So I, I don't think it's Alevness quite. I think this is a, this is, this is where Blanchot is trying to think about the, the human share in this relationality. Uh, a relationality that exceeds human being. So, um, I'll just finish what I'm saying and then come back to it. The, the, um, the, the, the host is really suffering, and when, uh, when he comes to talk about the fact that he's, he has to acknowledge that he's invited the other to come to him, he does it in pain, because he doesn't, uh, well, let's see, look at this a little bit more, but he doesn't want to implicate the other in this relationality. So, there is, in this uh, beginning, there is no affirmation. Uh, that I can see, anyway. There's no welcoming of this, of this pain. Um, there is a sense that they are called upon to bear it for the purpose of some benevolence, as they put at the outset. But um, I don't see any pleasure here. Um, and uh, not even the pleasure of a death drive at this point. There's, there is a suffering of the relation, but, uh, which is such that the host needs the other's presence. Again, for two reasons. In order that, not to carry out this relation, or to fulfill this relation, or to follow it through, but at the same time, just to be able to carry on. And, uh, and so again, that, that introduces the question of the turn I'm trying to get. How, how can you will the interruption in these conditions? Um, how can you will it, and how can there be something like a power that accrues via that will? If, what we're talk if the relation is one of powerlessness, of fatigue, of you know, pain, uh, of affliction, um, in what sense could there be this, um, this affirmative term? Yeah, I just, I, I don't, I just don't see it. <laughs> and, and let me, I'm sorry, oh, I didn't, yeah, you were going to say something more. Go ahead. 
No, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I mean, so in that, so only I had not realized that this, that what weariness makes possible, weariness makes difficult. I'm, I'm trying to, and I'm thinking about Heidegger here, about the, the possibility, uh, it's not maybe a welcoming, but the, the, um, the, the, cap the capable incapability of withstanding the, uh, what one cannot withstand. Does yeah. it, does, I mean, it's, I'm not like after the possible, possible, but the, there's something like that there, like the, the, the difficulty of that and the acknowledgement of the difficulty and not that one wants to go into that, but one has been able to withstand as much as one has and so one might have the sense that though it feels like it can't be withstood, it still might be, there's this like, I don't know, there's, I'm, I might be headed in the wrong direction there. Well, they have, there is this promise between them to evoke the event. So he's trying to fulfill the promise. And he's hoping that by virtue of this new, new accrual of weariness, of this cruel weariness, uh, but this new accrual of weariness, then perhaps he'll be able to do something he hasn't been able to quite to do before. And so, yes, there's a, there's a, there's a hope that appears there that to, to fulfill this, um, the saying of this relationality, maybe weariness will actually help at this point. But I think, in a sense, as we go forward, that will emerge as a diluted um, uh, uh, sentiment, um, that he will, he will, in effect, take that back. Yeah, okay, so he... Is it, is it that in weariness we're more receptive and more open to, to the new? Well, that's, you know, that's, that's what my ex-partner was saying. You know, you, you, you're just more open when, you, when you're tired. I mean, I just, yeah, but, but, he's, you know, but that's what she said about you, but he's saying about himself. So he, he's, he well, that's really what he know. hopes at this point. But I, I, what I'm saying in response is that I think he comes away, from, he, he leaves that position. Because there is more pain here than is acknowledged initially. I mean, it really does seem at the outset of the conversation that we're talking about exhaustion. These guys are... You know, it's been three weeks since that's right. But, um, you know, they are, they are reaching a point of, of um, near exhaustion. But as we proceed in, the, in, in this dialogue, it's, it emerges more and more as something other than exhaustion. So, something so other than fatigue in, a, in an everyday sense. I keep having this phrase about birth pain, and people like that, the pains of the need for the birth, of the need for the relationality. You know, just the pain that constantly evolves when you, when you move from one moment stage to another. Well, here there is. Uh, the old movies, the movies, but a radical break, you know. Here there is a break, and I, I, let's follow. I mean, I'm just saying, I'm not surprised it's uh, not pleasant. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, he suffers this point, but, but they do have a, have a marvelous. Um, they do have a marvelous gaiety about that, which comes up in the next paragraph. I just want to note this because there's, there's always this humor running through. It. He asks him, he would like to ask him, so everything suddenly gets conditionally qualified. And if you were not as weary as you say you are, what would you say to me? Which is almost a, an absurd statement. Well, what's the point of that? And he says, yes, what would I say to you? He repeats suddenly, almost gaily, a gaiety that he in turn cannot help pretending to share. And then, after what it seemed to him gaiety, and it's perhaps only liveliness, that follows the silence, he must break. I mean, as a phenomenologist, Blanchot is incredible. He must be this settle these nuances of, of, of uh, relation and of feeling in the most extraordinary way. This is very characteristic of his really. He would like to apologize for this pressure he exerts upon him in questioning him against his will, but he thinks he would exert it in any case, whether to question him or not, from the very moment he is present. And as we will learn later, um, the other needs this presence. He, he needs this to carry on. Um, otherwise, he thinks he would, he would not be able to carry on. And then suddenly the interlocutor seems to go into a kind of sleep. Into a, um, he, 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 pulls, he pulls out of the conversation. He closes his eyes. This is a, this is a, this is a, this is a big motif in the show. It comes back a lot in, in the um, step not beyond this, this sleeping. Um, and then he wakes up. What were, what were we saying? And the, um, the interlocutor is, is being very you know, solicitous, very benevolent. He's, he's trying to help. I'll come back. I believe you should rest. Um, yes, I need to rest, but we must first arrange to meet. So there's that beautiful gesture by which this last conversation has to be rescheduled. And, um, and they go on to acknowledge that each of them are equally weary. And we get this weary humor. Weariness is generous. Yes, indeed it is. I wonder how we would get on otherwise. But do we get on? One might ask oneself and perhaps reply that on the whole we get on fairly well. 
Each of them laughs at this. Yes, we get on fairly well. And then suddenly there is an event. One of them stands up, as though strengthened by this reassurance. He turns aside almost abruptly in a way that provokes a disturbance in the small room. He's turning toward the shelves where, one notices now, books are arranged in great number, in an order perhaps more apparent and rigorous, but which explains no doubt why even someone familiar with the room would not discover them at first sight. He does not touch a single line. He stays there, his back turned, and utters in a low but distinct voice, how will we manage to disappear? Could the whole new will despise what will we do in order to fade away? What, what can we do to... to uh, well, he doesn't quite use the word effacement here, but fade away. In a low but distinct voice, as if night settling around them with a tremor, it is broad daylight, you could recognize this, obliged him to reply, well, it would suffice for us. No, it would not suffice. Then passage to the next sentence. From the instant that this word, a word, a phrase slipped between them, something changed. The history ended. An interval should be placed between their existence and this word, and so forth. Let me let me just pause before going further into that paragraph. There is a suddenly in this weariness, a need is expressed. There is a um, there is there is a problem. Um, the question is how to how to escape this weirdness, um, how, to, um, how, how to find some sort of peace in relation to, the, um, to, to this event that has occurred, which, which we'll hear about. And one, we don't know who has turned, has stood up, um, but the other says, uh, in relation to that question, how will we manage to disappear, the other says, well, it would suffice, and then suddenly, no. A, Counter word. No, it would not suffice. Now there is a there is a counter word like this elsewhere in the infant conversation. It comes up in, and I was referring to it two nights ago in that ex, in that reading of Camus where he talks about Kaliyev expressing his inability to murder the Grand Duke. He, he says, "I'm in front of the Grand Duke and the children, so it's the visage, it's the face, and, and the infant." And, he's, and he says, I, "I I I could not, and even now I I cannot." I would not be able to murder the man in this, in this, in this situation. And Blanchot goes on to say, that I cannot is expressing in the language, is in the language, in a language of power, is expressing the powerlessness of language before the visage, before, um, before the, the face of the women and the children and, and the human being there. And this is the same presence of the human that he describes in that um, essay on Antel when he talks about the that those in the camps, that, um, that that presence is what he calls the true speech. Uh, that's, the, that's the presence of the human, in, in, in a sense. And Blanchot, I, there, I wish I had that passage in front of me, I keep forgetting to bring it to you, but they, Blanchot goes on at some length to say, in this, in this moment, in this instant, um, language is coming about, this is the origin of language, and it's coming about and saying its own limit before its, its powerlessness before this alterity, which is the face of the other. Okay? Um, so again, we have the idea of a neutral interruption, uh, um, and, and language expresses this with a, a negative phrasing, I cannot. Right? So it's a saying of powerlessness. There almost seems to be something like this at, at this point. No, it would not suffice. There's nothing that can be done. No, there's no way of we have no capacity for um, this, this fading. Otherwise, I'm not sure how to read that. I mean, I, 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 certainly there are other references to sufficiency in, in Moshe, but um, here there seems to be a, um, you know, a kind of interruptive expression which is expressing powerlessness. There is no action for, for what has to be done here. And then we go to the next passage, and we have to ask, well, it, what is this phrase, this word? Is it, is it not these last words? Right? No, it would not suffice. So I'll read it again. From the instant that this word, a word or phrase, slipped between them, something changed, a history ended, an interval should be placed between their existence and this word, but the word always comprises this interval, so there's no escaping it, whatever it may be, and also the distance that separates them and separates them from it. So this word is... is is, is introducing the distance, you know, that they can't escape. 
But, but I, let me read that again. From the instant this word slipped between the make history ended, an interval should be placed between their existence and the word. But the word always comprises this very interval, whatever it may be, and also the distance it separates them. They are always very conscious of this. It sometimes happens through guile or through neglect that they remain far from one another. It is easy. Life keeps them apart. And when they stop seeing each other completely, when the city assigns them rounds of life that do not risk bringing them back together, they would be satisfied if contentment were not also the manner in which the understanding of this word imposes itself upon them. They are not satisfied, therefore, and this is enough to render vain both distance and forget. So this word has already spoken or come between them before this conversation. In fact, this word has opened the space of the conversation. And they are always hearing this word. This is the entente. This is the ground of their entente. Together they hear this thing that, um, that defines that separation, that is their conversation. This word is between the two. This is the word of the conversation, the conversation, the holding between. So, no, it would not suffice is not the word, <laughs> apparently. And, um, and this next paragraph is discussing, is describing the situation with, within which all of this conversation has been unfolding. So it's not of the same temporal sequence. It, it's, it's moved back in time in this, in this next paragraph in relation to the one that describes the event in the library. And then suddenly he moves to another time. There is a moment, there is a moment in the life of a man, consequently in the life of a man, when everything is completed. The book's written, the universe silent, beings at rest. This seems to be something like that library, right? The library is complete. The library is full. This is the end of history. Um, the, the, the work of uh, a, uh, completing meaning has been, has been achieved. There is left only the task of announcing it. This is easy. But as the supplementary word threatens to upset the equilibrium, and where to find the force to say it, where to find another place for it, it is not pronounced, and the task remains unfinished. One writes only what I have just written, finding that is not written either. Again, a kind of, a kind of fading, right? A kind of uh, effacement. But this is an effacement of, a, of an incapacity to, to, say the, to say the end. I mean, when the end has been said, what, what else is to be said? Um, but Blanchet will say that's where the, the real question opens. That's where the real, uh, or something else is, is required of us. But interestingly enough, an I has appeared here. Right? There, is, there is a writing I in this space. And we have to ask ourselves as we go forward, at this point, it's pretty clear who's narrating. The narrator is the guest, right? He received me, he said this, I, I, you know, on and on and on. There's a narration on the part of the, of the guest. But there is another instance appearing, which is this I, the writing I, which, you know, from a, from a literary point of view, we can accommodate perfectly well. The, the one is, the, there is one writing who has created a, um, a narrator. You know, and we mustn't, it's basic literary criticism, we mustn't confuse the narrator and the, um, and the, and the one writing. And we can perfectly well have that one writing appear on the stage, so that, you know, that, that, that redoubles the, um, the mimetic uh, attribution. We can't identify that eye with Blanchot, and, and on and on. Um, you're all familiar with that. Um, but the question then remains, um, how do we think the writing of this conversation? Who is writing? From what instance is this conversation being written? And what is um, especially interesting about Blanchot is that he's perfectly capable of writing um, a testimony or uh, you know, writing a kind of history where he disassociates himself from himself. And that's exactly what happens in the instant of my death when he tells the story of being put up before the firing squad. Um, he says explicitly at one point, he, and I won't pretend to understand what he was feeling at that point. And so there is a, um, you know, he passes from I to he in talking about himself in the past. And it really breaks the, the relation as a relation of remembering. It's instead he inscribes a, a forgetting man. So Blanchot is cap perfectly capable of, uh, you know, this could be a, this could be a kind of a, a accounting of, a, a recounting of his uh, conversations with um, Bataille. Um, but if, if there is some recounting going on, the, the, the recounting instance, the writing I, is, is not in the same space in some way, or not in the same time, is what is being recounted. So we come then, 
again, when we come back to the guest, he remembers their conversation and so forth. But I want to jump to the next one, which is something that gets, uh, things get more complicated. I asked you to come, this is the host, the guest, the host, excuse me, the host. I asked you to come, he stops and says, do you remember how things happened? The interlocutor reflects and turns, I remember it very well. Uh, good, I was not very sure finally of having initiated the conversation myself. But how could I have come otherwise? Friendship would have sent you. He reflects again, I wrote to you, didn't I? On several occasions, but did I not also call you on the telephone? Certainly, several times. I see you want to be gentle with me. I am grateful. As a matter of fact, it's nothing new. The weariness is not greater, only it has taken another turn. The host now introduces a doubt as to the circumstances of the conversation. Why has the guest come, exactly? Um, was he actually responsible for inviting the guest? If he was, was there perhaps some impropriety in the, in the manner of inviting the other? Hence this anxiousness. I, I did ask you to come, didn't I? Oh, and and you know, I did so in various ways, and the other said, oh yes, of course, which suggests maybe there was something about this invitation that was not quite proper or not quite complete. Or maybe not even made, and, and so the, but the guest is trying to be solicitous, is trying to be, his benevolence is trying to reassure the other who is expressing anxiety about the circumstances of this relation. And what is what is the impropriety? We'll see this as we go forward. Um, I'm just going to jump ahead and try to explicate this. The impropriety is that, as he says, he's implicated in something in which he is not involved, something as we will go on that doesn't concern him. So how then could he invite the other to this relationality that does not even concern him? That would be that would be to commit a major impropriety because he's trying to get the other into this into this relation that doesn't even concern him. So how could he make it the concern of the other without afflicting the other with the suffering that he himself is suffering? So it would be an impropriety in relation to himself, I mean in relation to the guest, but it would also be an impropriety in relation to that with which he is in relation because it doesn't concern him. So why is he bringing another in in order to deal with etc. etc. The, the question is how does one relate properly to the, to the neutral? How does one relate to it in this relationship between the two? And the answer is there is no proper way. This is there is a fundamental impropriety here that that um, that the, the, get, the host is worrying about. So the guest is trying to help him through this. Um, And they, in a certain sense, there's a kind of a, this benevolence in, in the way of uh, the host, I mean the guest's reassurance, allows him to come then to a second expression of that difficulty. He says, speaking of weariness, it keeps us alive, it keeps us speaking. I would like to be able to state precisely when this happened, because it seems to be alluding to this new term in weariness. If only one of the characteristics of the thing did not make precision difficult, I can't help thinking of it. Well, then we must think of it together. Is it something that happened to you? Did I say that? And he adds almost immediately, with a force of decision that might just be, justly be termed moving, so much does it seem to exceed his four resources of energy. So where does this come from? Sudden access of energy. Nothing that has happened. Yet along with it, this reservation, nothing that has happened to me. The other still solicitous. Then in my eyes, it's nothing serious. I didn't say that it was serious. He continues to meditate on this, resuming, no, it's not serious. As if he perceived at that instant that what is not serious is much more so. Obviously, serious or frivolous are values that belong to the order of the day. This can't be described as either serious or unserious, um, in that it's not, again, of, this is not a matter of interest to either. Um, it is not a it is, it is not a matter of concern, either serious or, or not. Yeah. So is he saying here not that nothing has happened to him, but that the void or nothingness has encountered him? Has happened, but he can't claim to that it's happened to him as though he were the, the, the object of this. But because that would, that would that would instantiate himself too much in this relation. So well, it hasn't it hasn't singled him, so to speak, out. It hasn't singled him out. Rather it has come over him in such a way as to undo him to some extent. And so he can no longer say that it's me that this thing involves. Right? It's happened, but it hasn't, has not happened to me, as though I were the object of some action. It's an action what, without object. Why does it say to me in the second version then? 
Um, he says it twice, doesn't he? But the second time he's got to me on it. No, he says, nothing that's happened, yet along with this reservation, nothing that has happened to me. Right? Yeah. Oh, I see what you mean. So the first one is, when you put a comma after the nothing, then that's something that is happening to the person as opposed to nothing that is actually happening. So, so you know, if you encounter by the void, then the void is. So that's what's happened. Yes. But in the second one, it means that the way you say it hasn't happened to be in a singular sense. Yes, and again, it's a neutral relation, it's a relation with the neutral, so it's not a relation of subject and object. However, you might conceive that it, it's it's in a it's it's in that middle voice of something happening without agents and without uh, objects of reaction. Couldn't be in the accusative or the objective. And that's it. Then in my eyes, it's nothing serious. I didn't say that it was. Continues to meditate on this. No, it's not serious. His interlocutor must feel it and feel as well that he should do something to help it. Well. If it's not serious, then talking about it cannot be either. He looks at his friend, and so forth. And I go through, again, a discussion about uh, weariness. Again, there's a, there's a, a movement sort of back into the space of their understanding with one another, back into this benevolence. And then suddenly this entente, this hearing, this understanding, this, this, this um, common commitment gives way to something else. And again there is a statement. I don't know what's to become of me. Do you see that about ten lines down? Page 16. Each time, I'll just pick it up, about ten last time. Each time they hear these words that form for the instant the background against which all other words still, still stand out. Weary or benevolent, we understand one another. So they are in a common space of some kind. The disc, some kind of discourse, is some kind of, of bridge is still there now in conversation. Understanding that opens suddenly to this speech where nothing is expressed. Hardly more than a murmur. I don't know what's to become of me. Je ne sais que devenir. There's not really a me in that um, in the French. Je ne sais que devenir. I don't know what to become, literally. Um, but in, in an English locution, he would say, I don't know what's to become of me. So there's the solitude of the um, of the host. This re echoes softly. It does not let itself be disturbed. It's, it's a quasi neutral statement in itself. It's uh, utterly. Passive. And softly too he asks, but tell me, what has happened? And in the same way he receives the response, what had to happen? Something that does not concern me. Suddenly this event takes on a necessary character. Russia will insist upon that. It's, it's, it's both a gain, but also a, a, it's, not just, it's not simply contingent in any normal sense of the term. At once he is struck by the manner in which the statement remains at a distance. It is not solemn. It makes hardly any call upon him. It does not change the late born in light. He knows that it is, after all, only a sentence, and that it would be better not to translate it into this other, that nevertheless he cannot refrain from offering. Do you want me to understand that this might concern me? So the, the guest now, you know, he can't enter the same space. Um, he, he immediately brings in a self-concern. He alludes to himself. Right? Oh, so if it doesn't concern me, does it concern me? It concerns neither one of us. Silence has a character to which he does not attend. Suddenly the, the entente is breaking. He can't hear the silence. Give it up entirely to the impression that a threshold has been crossed, a force of affirmation broken, a refusal thrust aside, but also a challenge issued, not to him, the benevolent interlocutor, but impersonally, or, yes, it is strange, to someone else, to the event in which precisely neither one is involved. He would like to be able to keep himself at a distance in this in order to better, better to reflect on this. And it seems to him that he will have the time for this. Time is getting distended. As though he had been forgotten, that is, as though he had to confront this forgetting in order to think of it. Beautiful evocation of a slippage in relation to this, you know, this, this, this temporal dynamic. I'll just continue. It is true, does he think of it later, does he think of it now, that he feels temporarily abandoned by the conversation of which there subsists only the absence. An absence itself also benevolent. 
Perhaps this continues, but perhaps what follows comes immediately. What he is now ready to hear, this concerns neither one, this concerns no one. Cela ne concerne ni l'un ni l'autre. Cela ne concerne. I think it's cela ne concerne personne. Is this what you wanted to tell me? The other gives him a pained look. I didn't want to, and still now I do not want to. After which he is silent in a way that can only mean, help me, you must help me. An awful lot has happened there, obviously. Um, there is a speaking when the, um, you know, which is almost neutral speaking, tell me what has happened, what had to happen, what, and he says, this doesn't concern us. And this is, I, I would say, this is, here is the sentence being transcribed with the phrase that um, had existed between them, but which hasn't been brought to speech or hasn't, hasn't been dealt with in some way. Um, this is the sentence or the phrase that, that we had the allusion to before, which is, this concerns no one. Cela ne me concerne pas. This, does, this doesn't concern me. And when it's said, again, Cela ne concerne ni l'un ni l'autre. This concerns neither one of us. Ni l'un ni l'autre, again, as I, as I hinted, that it's one of those terms by which Blanchot tries to think the neutral. So he is, there's a hint of a neutral of a relation. It concerns neither one of us. And that sentence introduces a silence. It is a speech of a silence that the, that the guest can't quite hear. But... He's under the impression that there is a speaking to another that has occurred. He's not speaking to, to the guest anymore. That, that the other has begun to speak to another. Right? That's the other for which a place had been held, presumably. And curiously enough, this has the character of a challenge. Right? It is, it's not a, it's maybe a neutral saying that doesn't disturb the light, but as a saying, it is, um, you know, there's something, um, not violent, he doesn't suggest it's violent, but, but there is a, there's a real act here, a challenge. Show yourself, <laughs> in some sense, right, uh, this, the, to this other, or in some way, um, be there. Because this is the problem of the host. What is he at grips with? It's, it, um, and he will say later on, please, circle, show yourself. Um, give me some something to hold on to here. Um, so there is a there is a as he says there's a challenge to to the conversation itself. I don't, I don't quite like the way I phrased that in uh, you know, like the show yourself, but there there is a there's an effort to come to grips with something or to have a relation to something, to draw out a relation with what doesn't give relation. Now, what is so stri one of the things that's striking to me here, this idea of a challenge. Um, this is precisely the kind of language. Heidegger uses to talk about how we bring language itself to speech. Um, I said to you earlier today that, that um, if there is a narrative here in the early part of this conversation, it is, a it is a narrative of a bringing to language of language, of a certain kind of language. Um, here he's, he's trying to bring the neutral to speech, right? or to bring a neutral speaking to, um, to speech. And there is a, there is, this is what Heidegger calls a gegenwort, um, a, a counterword. Um, an effort to, to make what is uh, what, what does not normally come to language come to language. And once this, I mean, in a certain sense, what's happened, once the, in, the, the, the host addresses, let's just say, the other, the conversation has, dis has been displaced and has, has opened to another level. It's another conversation. This is a conversation between the host and the conversation itself. So it's, it's no longer the same conversation. He says it's the absence of a conversation. Um, we're moving to a different level, and the, and the guest has been, to a certain extent, left aside. The, le the guest is as though forgotten, and is scrambling to, uh, to find his place in, in this relationality. But that place is given to him by the other, um, temporarily at least, as he expresses his distress. So the host is um, in, in relation with the other of the conversation, but that relation is one that gives him an extreme distress. So he calls again to the other right, for a kind of humane assistance. Help me. 
you must help. So there, there, is, there is a real distress in this relation. And so the other comes back <laughs> at the level of understanding. Both are thoughtful to realize that they should not remain there. One, so he supposes, because he now feels the need to speak. The other, for a reason he does not delay in expressing. Why did you not want to? You know very well. I feared compromising. He feared compromising, as I, I, I've sort of given him, I've tried to hint at what I understand to be the answer there. He, d he does, he, it would be inappropriate to bring the other, the, the guest, into a relation that does not concern the host. And if he were to bring that other, the guest, into that relation, he would be imposing this distress upon the guest. And that would be a rather inappropriate thing to do in terms of hospitality. Um, so his, his distress about the conditions of the guests visiting and being there and his involving the guest in this relation is precisely in relation to this impropriety, this transgression vis-a-vis -vis this other presence of the neutral. And as we go forward in the, in the conversation, he will emphasize over and over again that there is, that the, any relation to the neutral is a transgressive relation and that there's always the um, presence of a law, here, always the presence of, a, of, a, of an interdiction. That an interdiction is being broken when he addresses the conversation itself. So this is a, 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 help, a, a request for help by someone who has made a transgressive move in relation to the, to the conversation. But it's a request for help of a very humane kind, because as we go on, he will acknowledge that um, the other can't help uh, up to a certain degree. So let, let me just read that a little bit more. I feared compromising him. For an instant he accepts this idea if only to make it lighter. Well, now there's no place for that fear. Have we not, since we met, been engaged together, bound to lend assistance to one another as before the same arbiter? Engaged together? Engaged in the same discourse. And the word that comes back to engagé. Um, and I just can't help but think there's some echo of, of Sartre and an idea of common commitment. True, but because of this also we must take heed. I am aware of my responsibilities. This is the host speaking. As I am also in regard to you. You are. It would be unfriendly not to recognize it. But up to a certain point. He questions himself about this limit. Then he ceases to question. And if you think about it, he's saying, it would be unfriendly not to recognize it. But up to a certain point. So there's a point at which Non-recognition is not unfriendly, and there would be a friendship that exceeds recognition. There would be a relation of friendship beyond a relation of self. Marcus? And this would be like moving beyond Hegel? Absolutely. Outside of terms of recognition? Yeah. This is where friendship is really being named, at that limit. And that's why now, once we get to this point, the other will start to say, why are you here exactly? Is it just friendship, <laughs> which doesn't involve me? <laughs> so so the, you know, the, the, it's an extraordinarily complex uh, relation. But there, a break has occurred now, it seems to me, and we hear this in the following words. He questions himself about this limit, then he ceases to question. You mean as much, in as much as we speak? That's right, speaking is the last chance remaining for us. Speaking is our chance. So he's trying to hold on, in a way. And the other says, you would not listen to me if I spoke. But I listen. I too listen. Well, what do you hear? They remained always facing one another, yet turned away, each looking at the other only from a great distance. You asked me to come so that I might talk about it. I asked you to come in order not to be alone in thinking about it, and so forth. Oh, let me just read the line. But, he adds with a faint gaiety, I have never been alone since I have been thinking of it. I will never again be alone. I understand. Yes, you understand, he says sadly. You know, I have been weary for, for some time. You mustn't pay too much attention. He's pulling away at, at this point. And even in there, there's, a, there's a mark of sadness in that understanding because the, the guest is still in the, this modality of understanding, of ensemble, of being in the same conversation. And the, the host has marked now a limit in relation to that because, as he says, his, he would, the other would not be able to hear his speaking. Why is that? Because presumably his speaking would be in a neutral that doesn't concern the other. 
and the other is still trying to exercise concern in relation to his friend. So the uh, disjunction, again, is, is this remarking the disjunction, disjunction that we've already seen, whereby the host is speaking to another, not to the interlocutor. And the interlocutor is, is just is, is, has a feeling suddenly that the, the conversation has shifted levels. And then as, the, um, as, as he tries to help the other and to regain their common ground, the host says, if I were to speak, you couldn't hear it. And the suggestion being there would be a different form of speaking. Later in the conversation, there is a phrase that um, is, appears also as the epigraph to the book. And that's on page 21. The neutral, the neutral, le neutre, le neutre. How strangely this sounds to me. So for the me, that uh, sounding of the neutral is something uh, foreign. Uh, and that's, I would suggest, is what the, the guest cannot yet hear in this passage. This strange sounding of the neutral, which the host has been in effect giving voice to. Cela ne concerne ni l'un ni l'autre. This is the phrase that happened between them. But again, the guest is not quite in the same place as the host. They're in an uneven relationship. In relation to what both of them are suffering, which is weariness. At this point, anyway, the host is ahead of the, the guest. I see concern in two faces of the day. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's different kinds of weariness. There are different kinds of concern. Yeah, go ahead. Different kinds of concern. And you said earlier that um, the host doesn't want to compromise because the host doesn't think that this concerns the other. But I think, in a way, he does at the same time. Does think that this concerns the other very much. So. It, but but he doesn't want he doesn't want to make that explicit. I think it, well I, well, I think maybe to this neutral which is trans subject. It's possible the way you're saying, but I, I, the way I would understand this is that he doesn't want to implicate the the guest in this relation without relation, which is no longer a relation of being concerned by this thing, but being implicated in some way. And he, I'm using language that appears a little bit later in the text, when he, when he says he's being, he's inscribed in a circle that doesn't include him, and, or implicated in this writing. And that's, I think, what he's, he's afraid of implicating the other in, in that way. Okay? And I do think it's the same weirdness, because the two seem to be able to occupy these positions in different temporalities. Or it may be weariness at different levels, many different levels, and, and, and certainly different levels of understanding. Yeah. I, I missed the point where, so we have a moment where two people are talking, but then one of them also talks, starts talking, the talking itself, the conversation itself, right? Why do you need two? Why is it necessary? Why can't you just start and talk with the conversation itself? Does he say it doesn't matter? It's important about that. Blasio insistently comes back to the sense that we need the other. So, and well, I think... Well, if we can start to the language itself. Yes. Or this alterity. Or this alterity that he calls the neutral. So the other is this third part? No, the other is the other human being. Ah. Yes. So, in, in Heidegger, um, you know, Heidegger says language needs human being. And in this way of being toward language that I've been describing, being underway to language, that relation doesn't imply a relation to another human being. The thinker may be in a dialogue with the poet, but that is not with the person of the poet. It's, it's, the dialogue is trying to bring poetry to sound over against the, the, the sounding of thoughtful saying. So this is, you know, the thinker is in a certain sense alone on this path of bringing thought to sound in itself and to, and to thereby render possible a reflection on the essence of language. So in Heidegger, very, and he says at the very explicitly at, at the end, um, this, is, this does not involve the other human being. Not yet. At the level at which he's working, we are not yet in, in the mid-Dasein. Um, whereas in Blanchot, this relation seems to be necessary. There must be another human being for this alterity. To, to, to be brought forward in speech. And um, as uh, Blasio puts this very abruptly at one point in the beginning of the infinite conversation, he says, alterity comes to us only from the other human being. And, and, and that's partly um, his atheistic statement, um, 
we do not go to God for, the, uh, for alterity. It's, it's just we go to the other human being, and alterity is in this relation to other human beings. But it exceeds the human. That's why I said that um, what, what we seem to have here is in this solicitous relation where the one extends the hand to the other. This is the, this is the human relation at grips with something that exceeds the human, which is what he's calling the neutral. Okay? So, so for Blanchot, the human is all, always needed and at the same time needed because, because there's precisely a relation with something that exceeds the human. At the very beginning of the Blanchot, I was thinking like writing itself is the only thing that, you know, a writer starts writing and then you have the alternative and you know, Yes. And, and you know, this, you know, were it not for the fact that the presence of the other is always working at these texts, you know, um, always in, in his literary texts, I would say, yes, there is something like development here. But it really is only in his thinking that he brings forth this, this ethical relation, if you will, this, um, this, this solicitous relation, or this, and I'm, 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 I'm trying to pick up a very big theme in him, this extending of the hand to the other. Um, that is, that's something that, in his theory anyway, it, it's, it's when he announces the importance of Levinas's thinking that this really comes forward. Although, as I said, in the literary writing, there are lots of scenes like this, well before this. But at this point, theoretically, he's, he's, he's saying, we cannot have this relation to alterity without the relation to the other human being. That's a pretty strong statement. I mean, it's a very strong statement about the necessity of community as he will think it. Even as he's saying, don't confuse this with some form of humanism, because what we're at grips with here is something beyond the human. So it, it, uh, but at the same time, there is this irreducible need for the other human being, and uh, the irreducible dimension of the ethical relation. There's, what we follow, as I, I've been trying to suggest, is this course of encounter right, in between these two, which has, in a sense, the, the hearing that brought them together has, has splintered in some way, or broken, and the, the conversation itself, at one level anyway, has, has fragmented in order to give way to this other, other relation, other, <coughs> other conversation. And again, there is a, the, 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 that sort of human uh, need reappears at, at the very end of the section that we've been reading. When they, they seem to be pulling back from the breach a little bit, um, pulling back from the brink, and um, there's a laughter between them. It's, it's at the very end of that section. They each laugh again after evoking the weary truth of weariness. The space freed for an instant where he hears a bit later in the silence as though it had been necessary for him to be silent in order to say it. Promise me you will not draw away too soon. So there's a again an appeal to the other. And the conversation will go on in what follows. I mean, it seems a kind of stilted, or it seems kind of interrupted at this point, right? and when it does reappear in the conversation again. But it will, it will take, it will, it will be picked up again between the two, so it's not an irremediable breach of their understanding or their, their relation. But at the same time, the, uh, um, the, the, the conversation will, will multiply. Um, it will take different forms. The, the two who are in conversation are, um, they, they always speak in the second person uh, formal, right? formal relation, vu. It's always uh, um, the one in relation to the other is, is, speaks as, as vu. Um, but in the course of the conversation, there are other kinds of address and response that start to appear, and they appear in the second person, in the familiar second person, tu. So um, it sometimes appears as though a kind of conversation is opened up in uh, within one of the two interlocutors. So it's as though a voice is questioning the interlocutor from within, so to speak, like something like a voice of conscience or uh, some other voice that's like that, that is attending this other. Um, it's get, it gets very hard to to pin this down, and it's probably very important to be attentive to all the forms of speaking that occur here. But there is a kind of a multiple, or the fragmentation that occurs in the conversation now results in a multiplication of voices. And it becomes impossible to, um, to pin these down, and to, to 
to, to, to absorb this, um, this these fragmentary these fragments into a um, into a single or unified space. And as he said, we have to we have to begin thinking without uh, reference to unity. But some of this is actually quite quite opaque. I mean, where are these voices coming from? Who, um, I'll try to follow this to some extent with regard to one of these voices, or more than one of these voices. But um, that, that if you follow it through there, um, I won't be saturating this space in, in what I have to say. There are, there are relations that are opening that, that, that you know, for what I will try to touch upon don't, uh, that doesn't, doesn't um, incorporate. So he really is, he, he does, it does seem that this, this passage, this bringing to speech of this other speaking or this, this other conversation really is um, a breaking apart of the conversation and the introduction of, of genuine fragmentation, uh, genuine plurality. We have a fragment of the, of the you know, residue of the conversation. I suppose I should have been concerned about this situation earlier. It seems to me we've always been, we've always attended to it. In a certain way that's true, and so forth. That seems to be a residue of the ongoing conversation. 18, I'm sorry. But then suddenly there is a, it passes to another uh, temporal. It's no longer in the, in the present. And again we have to ask, um, who is speaking here, and of whom? Let me just read this, this is, a, this is really quite beautiful passage. He recalls in what circumstances the circle was traced as though around him. The circle, rather the absence of a circle, the rupture of that vast circumference from which, from which come the days and nights. Here's what we saw a reference to this in the, in the essay on the interruption. Of this other circle, he knows only that he is not enclosed within it, and in any case that it, he is not enclosed in it with himself. On the contrary, the circle being traced, he forgets to say that the line is only beginning, does not allow him to include himself within it. It is an uninterrupted line that inscribes itself while interrupting itself. So here it is, kind of expression of interruption, or inter interruption occurring in a, in a form of inscription. Let him admit for an instant this trace, traced as though in chalk, and certainly by himself, by whom otherwise, or else by a man like him that does not differentiate. There's another already. Let him know that it disturbs nothing in the order of things. Let him sense, nevertheless, that it represents an event of a particular kind. Of what kind he does not know. A game, perhaps. Let him remain motionless, called upon by the game to be the partner of someone who is not playing. And sometimes addressing himself to the circle, saying to it, Try once in different circle, if only for an instant, to close up again, so that I know where you begin, where you end. Be the circle the absence of a circle, traced by writing or by weariness. Weariness will not permit him to decide even if it is only through writing that he discovers himself weary, entering the circle of weariness, entering as in a circle into weariness. Now there's, there are, of course, several uh, fascinating things about this. Um, one of the curious things is, is Blanchot's insistence upon using the metaphor of a circle. Why a circle here? Um, a circle describes a circumference, a, a, in some, you know, the word to concern says a circle, right? Concerné. Cerné is to enclose within and, and enclose within together. This circumference, this circle does not enclose together. It rather, it, it, it disrupts any self-enclosure or any closure within which the self could find itself contained. This circle um, is, is, the tracing of this circle is an exposure to an outside. So um, why the circle? Why this? Uh, why is if, if he's break, if he's breaching every horizon in the sense of a horizon of phenomenology, which is requires an ego and a self in relation to this horizon? Why circle? Um, I think it has to do at the end of that essay an interruption with the reference to a hyperbolic interruption. This is a this circle is the hyper is the hyperbole. Uh, Marcus, yeah, I saw a couple hands up. Uh, I mean the. Surpassing or going beyond the horizon is a very paradoxical gesture. Yeah, because like as one approaches the horizon, it always yeah, it always moves right. It like is always yeah. further away from me. So, but it's also it's breaching the horizon. It's well, yeah, but I mean, how? so there's no no longer a horizon. And that's precisely his problem. Where do you begin? Where do you end? Yeah, Where yeah, am I? He's exactly. in a space without differentiation. In, in a, um, you know, in a, uh, yeah, a space without differentiation. So I, well, I think, I see my, 
Logical dilemmas like that, isn't there? A donut? That, um, what's so I'm going to the chorus and the yeah. 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 It's the same kind of thing, but it's, I think in three dimensions. Uh, yeah, but no you can't project it into three dimensions. Because that folding requires an additional dimension, which means, for example, in circle, we have to go to the second dimension, from one dimensional line. So in the climb, we have to go to the three dimensional surface, but because of this weird folding, it needs to. One more dimension, so you can only pro uh, draw a projection of it. Mm. So it's a bottle which doesn't have an inside or outside. So it's, it's a generalization of movies. I can draw. Yeah. I don't think we need it, but that's very interesting. I mean, it's, uh, I it's think there, are think there are topological ways of, of, of presenting this, the, the, the dilemma that is described. I think it's also somewhere in movies, something like the circle, the whole concept, and then you. I think, too, like in the hyperbolic space, you can get some of these effects even just with the circle. If it's a non-Euclidean space, hmm. uh, you these weird sort of manifold spaces that wrap around. Yeah, yeah, but you need one more than one dimension. That's yeah, 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 In yeah. one box, a circle is one dimension. So what, no matter what you do, you don't have this inside-outside games. You have to go more than one dimension. So circle is, I think, really, I don't know, if you look from this direction, it's really a wrong object to choose. But hmm. And maybe strip is the closest thing. You thicken the circle, you rotate it, glue it. Well, it is it is very strange because you know he talks about also you know, the rupturing the circle of circles, you know the the, the, the totalizing circle of, of you know the self uh, thinking itself, you know in the Hegelian sense, or any any kind of self reflection, and then or the circle, you know the, the circle of the West, or leaving home to come back to the home, and so on and so forth. I mean it's, it's you know, over and over again this this figure of the circle, and and yet he comes back to it. It's, it's really very strange that he uses that. <coughs> but anyway, it's very clear that this is this, you know, a, a disruptive <laughs> relation that he's naming. And there is a, something about this. Um, um, there's something about this passage that I think is, is rather curious and, and important. Um, again, I don't want to suggest that he's reading Heidegger in this passage, but it's very striking that in the essay in which Heidegger talks about being underway toward language, he says, in order to um, have this engagement with the essence of language, we have to we have to make a step. We have to dare to make a step, um, and we have to. I, I like the phrase I came up with. So we have to steal a march upon language. We have to draw a line, and this is the Gagin relation that that, that he, he brings forward. We have to we have to provoke language to speech, um, and, and in Heidegger, there's always the sense of an initiative. There has to be a. a um, and acting that draws out this relation will, that will turn out to be the ground. But um, in, in the essay on language, he, he starts <coughs> emphasizing the, the, the term fermutum, um, a, a pr to presume. We have to presume a relation, fermutum. And he works a lot with the, with the term mut, which means heart, and it's also a kind of stimul. But um, there, is this, there is this fermutum, which Heidegger sometimes gives in a subjective, uh, it, it, with us in a subjunctive uh, mode. May this be, or, um, you know, or, or let us, let us propose. Um, may the essence of language be called Alphys. That's one of those subjunctive phrases. Get it up, pick that up. 
Um, there's a kind of, uh, it's a little bit on the modality of that it may be in the Das ist Sei that we saw in the origin of the work of art. But there's this, there is the, a kind of, um, again, a subjective um, positing. It's not a positing, it's a subjective allowing, so to speak, by presumption or vermutung. That's sort of what we have here. Let him admit for an instant this trace, traced as the one shot. Qu'il admit, in French. Let him know. Qu'il sache that it disturbs nothing. <coughs> Subjunctive phrase. Let him sense. Qu'il pressent, I can't remember what sensing there is. Um, in French. Um, Qu'il reste sans motionless. Maybe is that sans bouger? I can't remember. But a series of, of sort of subjunctive. Um, not positings, but subjunctive entertainings, let's say, um, of trying to grasp that re relation. And sometimes dressing to the circle, saying, try once for a moment to close up again so that I know where you begin. Que ce cercle soit tracé par l'écriture ou par la fatigue. Again, going into the subjunctive, but it doesn't go anywhere. It just dissipates. It just moves into the circular relation. So whereas, whereas in Heidegger, it produces the counter word and it produces the relation that he's trying to think, in this case, willing by this odd sort of uh, sub, 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 subjunctive, let us suppose, you know, let us presume, let us imagine, let us, let us entertain, but nothing happens. <laughs> so it's a, it's a kind of a, a will that, that is exercised, but the will dissipates, and there's something, um, it doesn't go anywhere. Weariness will not permit him to decide, even though, even if it's only through writing that he discovers himself weary, entering the circle of weariness, entering as in a circle into weariness. So again, we come back to the question, how does it come about that he wills the interruption? What, where is this will coming from? Or how do we understand this will if, um, if, if this is, if, if this, um, if any initiative seems to, in some sense, fail, in the sense of, a, by, by reason perhaps of the weariness, by this defiance, I'm using the French, you know, a failing, a lapsing, um, an, an inability to, uh, to turn this about, so to speak, and to produce the circle in a way that would allow him to situate himself in relation to the circle. And then Blanchot goes on to uh, name this as an event. Um, everything began for him, when everything seemed to have come to an end, with an event from which he could not free himself. Not that he was obliged to think of it constantly or remember it, but because it did not concern him. He only perceived, and no doubt well after it had come about, so long a time that he preferred to place it in perhaps a reason in the present, that something had happened. Something apart from the glowing history, rich with meaning, yet emotionless, in which everyone was taking part. By noting among the innumerable facts and great thoughts that were soliciting him the possibility that this had occurred, not without his knowledge, or necessity he knew, but without his being interested. So that's again a relation, uh, without relation, without concern without his being able to define it as a concern for him. And then again, everything begins for him with an event from which he cannot free himself. Again, playing with the temporality and, and again an allusion to an event. And again the question is, um, who, who is speaking here? The whole, throughout this um, narrative, it has been the guests recounting. And the guest is recounting the experience with the host from a, from a position of a certain distance. They share weariness, <coughs> but they are, you know, two separate um, beings. And the one is clearly in advance of the other, and there's difficulty between them, and anxiety, concerns about propriety, and so on and so forth. And then suddenly, we're in the head of somebody here, <laughs> um, and how could that be the, the guest? Something has happened whereby... The, the narration is shifting. The, the, who's narrating? Is it, is, it, is it possibly still the guest? Well, perhaps. But now the guest is capable of, of recounting the experience of the other. So somehow there has been a, um, a shift, an interruption, a, 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 a dislocation of some kind, by which um, the narrative, the narrating position has shifted. Perhaps it's not the guest at all. Or perhaps, uh, who's narrating, or perhaps this is the experience of the guest once he has been through this experience with the other. 
with the host. So, you know, perhaps we're repeating the experience, but now with the guest. But then again, who's narrating <laughs> this? So it's, uh, you know, the, the, all these questions will simply uh, reproduce themselves and complicate themselves without our being able to, uh, to pin this down. <clears throat> if the, you know, if we, if we assume that there is another narrator, not the guest, or even if we assume that the guest is the narrator, something in this dialogue has happened such that there has been a dislocation. So we have, again, this is another mark of fragmentation. Something, something has displaced the narrative act itself. So who is he? Not clear. But it becomes increasingly, increasingly an issue for one. And the question is, as I said, how does he, how does he come to will? How does, how does the, um, how does this proceed in the world? There are, uh, I want to pick up a few um, statements that are made as, as I go forward and just try to um, sort of follow a movement through the text. But as I, as I try to insist here, I mean, this thing really is breaking apart in a way, and I have to leap over some very interesting and very important passages and, 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 and in producing a line, or, and I'm following a line in this, I'm really not following other lines. And, um, and so in that sense it's not, a, it's not a reading in the sense that we would take into account everything that is there. On the contrary, it's, it's, um, it's rather partial. But there is, a, there is, a, there is a, this development that I've been trying to follow with you whereby he comes to will the interruption and he comes to gain a power. And that's what I want to, to follow with you just a moment. <clears throat> Implicated in a speech that is exterior to me. I'm on the next page. Thank you. When you are there and we speak, I become aware that when you are not there, I am implicated in a speech that could be entirely exterior to me. And you would like to say it to me in order not to be implicated in it alone. But I'm not alone in it. In a certain way, I'm not in it. What is troubling you? The fact of being implicated in a speech that is exterior to me. Um, so they are continuing, apparently. And he continues, if you were not there, I believe I could not bear the weariness. So there is a, again, that solicitude, and yet I also contribute to it. That is true, you weary me very much, but precisely very much within human limits. That's my reason for insisting on the human. Nevertheless, the danger is not averted. When you are there, I still hold on. I have the desire to spare you. I do not give up appearances entirely. This will not last long. I ask you to go then. I ask you then to go, out of respect for weariness. I will go then. No, don't leave yet. Mm -hmm. like, you know, constant hesitation, interruption. This is negotiating this, this relationship. 